Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to another session of Regen Civics. Today, we're going to be diving a little bit into what I'm calling the ecosystem mapping for our alliance itself. So answering some questions like, what DAO platforms are we using? Where do we launch our tokens? Um, are we launching multiple tokens? What tools do we use to coordinate? Um, because setting the context here, if our alliance is about scaling collaboration amongst ourselves, we have to use tools that talk to each other. Otherwise, we're not really able to scale that collaboration. So this is really an exploration into what tools would we like to use. And with, yeah, I'll pause there. Does anyone else have anything to add as far as the overview of what we want to cover today? And we've talked about this in a few previous sessions. So I'll pause here in case anyone wants to add more color before we get going. Oh, okay. So we pretty much framed the question. Uh, I think to kick us off, because this is a, an all-encompassing tool, which is really powerful, I'll send it over to Sam. And Sam, you can introduce all the beautiful things that you're holding. And I think this will help get the conversation started today. I know we're going to right into it because it's a big one. So without further ado, Sam. Yeah, thank you. Uh a little presentation, so I'll, I'll be showing that briefly, but um, just to give a bit of background before, so I don't know how many of you like into the whole traditional Dream Factory project, uh, but that's a little bit what uh, basically in Portugal, and yeah, we are really trying to see how we can actually create for, for Web3 communities real assets, so to land. And there's like a handful of projects around the world that are trying to do this kind of things um, because I think the future is, is there. Um, so maybe I'll just run through it um, and then we can have time for questions after because, yeah, it's all pretty new territory and I'm sure it's, uh, it's confusing for a lot of people. Uh, so basically, what we've been doing is we've been taking out all this. Uh, the tech that we were building under OASA, so the collective, uh, the network of villages um, that includes traditional dream factory um, and creating an open source tech stack that's uh, collectively owned by the communities that operate it. And our goal is to build an operating system that powers in real life regenerative communities. And so it's really to build tech that really serves the kind of village of this group. Um, so we're kind of in the intersection between Web3, regeneration in real life communities. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, pretty obvious, but yeah, we're trying to create planet positive outcomes uh, through the use of Web3. And this is what we basically call refi. It's how can we value a living forest more than a dead forest. And I think we have a real opportunity to turn all of these regenerative villages into actual natural asset providers down the road, but I'm not gonna go into that for now. Um, right now, we, what we really want is, uh, we had this idea of a village in a box last uh, last year. That's a little bit where a lot of the conversation started. Um, and so what are some of the things that we need in order to create those villages and give them the tools that they need? So um, we had already, events, bookings, memberships, communications, this line for like, we're really looking at like the user facing side of, of the tech stack for, for these villages. Um, and then in the second layer, um, we want to be able to tokenize the collective stewardship of these spaces. Uh, so how can we govern uh, villages through, through the use of a token? And then also uh, linking up that token uh, into um, some DAO stack where you handle your governance. Um, and potentially down the road, creating some village uh, to village bridges. So whether it's token swaps or uh, having like access to other villages through the token that you already have, as with the memberships that you already have in different villages and so on. Um, and then it goes to make a, a, a platform that's collectively owned by all the, the communities that, that use it. And so that's why we're creating Closer DAO. Um, and yeah, and one last principle is we're trying to make it really pragmatic and 
non-addictive. Um, so instead of being like Facebook, where it's like notifications and trying to keep you on the platform all the time and so on, here our goal is really to get you to just be in the village and connect with other members. Uh, you just go to the platform to do your booking. So it's more like Airbnb, uh, but we also include events and all this other stuff. So you can also like, yeah, just have kind of your, your toolbox that you need to, to run your village. Um, so for a little bit of background, so the ways that this is set up, um, I'm going to talk about OASA uh, because we're really trying to model uh, this tech stack that we're creating out of what we're building in the real world, so out of traditional dream factory. And so OASA is a nonprofit. Um, it's uh, based in Switzerland. Uh, its purpose is to take land out of the public market to protect it under regenerative land land use agreement um, and then to give access to its members uh, to those lands. Um, so the legal stack, basically you have the, the land title, which is held by a local company in Portugal currently, but in the future so there's going to be one local entity for, for each uh, project. This is what we call the, the DEFCO, the development company. Um, it's an entity that's going to be yeah, taking care of the, um, like developing the project. You might have like a separate operations company down the road uh, to have a better uh, legal protection. Uh, and then this local uh, company is 100% owned by the nonprofit in Switzerland, which kind of just operates as a land trust. It's not a land trust per se, but we're kind of trying to enforce the same kind of principles that a land trust would do. Um, and then this is where it becomes interesting is that that we're then linking it to a DAO through our white paper. Um, and so the DAO basically um, gets a governance right of how these spaces are operated. Um, and then the DAOs are then uh, governed by the members um, through their participation in the project, whether that through the token directly or through some other systems like the proof of presence that I'll bring up in a second. Um, so yeah, really what we're trying to do is to put land back into the commons uh, while giving the utility of the village to the members. Um, and so just on a little note on OASA, so part of the principles that we have drafted for uh, regeneration and land stewardship is that we want to basically protect 50% of the land as uh, like rewild 50% of the land and only have a 5% constructed area. Um, for the land. And then we have all kind of other principles about uh, how we want to restore the water cycle, foster biodiversity, and all these kind of things. And this is not super clear yet how we're going to be doing it in closer, but this is definitely some things that we would like to encourage is that any communities that operates on closer kind of follows similar kind of principles and guiding ideas. Uh, we're here to empower regenerative communities, not just um, create another. Uh, capitalistic Airbnb basically. Um, but yeah, so um, so far I think in in this uh, incubator we've been talking about the different tools that you need to to operate your DAO village. Uh, so basically you're gonna have your governance platform, whether it's one hive, snapshot, hypha, whatever, that's where you kind of handle the governance. Um, I know hypha does a lot more things than that, like roles and, and so on and so on. But you need some kind of thing where you can take decisions together and where the, the output is recorded to, to a chain so that you can, you can come back to it and you can kind of trust um, that whatever decisions are being made are uh, immutable. Um, and then you want to have a multi-sig. Um, so Gnosis is like kind of a standard. Um, I think within Hypha, you have that kind of built in, right? So you might not need that. Um, but then, yeah, now when it gets interesting is once you want to launch your token. And so once you create your token, you want to create some kind of tokenomic around it. Uh, we're in the process of drafting the white paper for TDF. Um, so kind of trying to describe what the token means. And in our case, it's a utility token that gives you access um, to, to the space. Um, and so we're creating closer in order to build the tech stack that's going to be providing utility to that token. Um, so the models that we are developing is a, we call it a perennial nightly token because it renews every year. So one token is once spent 
uh, is one night spent at the property um, in a basic accommodation, and then you can use multiple tokens to, to get more advanced accommodation. Uh, but that's a kind of basic idea. So our total supply is our total occupancy. How many nights available do I have every year? Um, and yeah, we're in the process of um, getting the functionality up on the seller network. Uh, we have it on the test net already, and the goal is to have it on mainnet by end of the year. Um, and this is kind of the models that we're pioneering and that we want to make available to other people. But then we also want to be able to create other smart contracts and other token models in the future. Uh, whether you want to have a token that gives you a single night of stay instead of being every year that renews, for example. Um, so if you have 100 tokens, you can stay for 100 night and then that's it. You just spend your tokens. Uh, but it could also be something like long-term lease NFTs or any kind of tokenomic model that you would like to have. Uh, we just want to enable you to be able to use it on our platform. Um, so for example, we have a user who owns TDF tokens. That user becomes a member of the TDF DAO um, and that it then enables them to stake their TDF tokens in our uh, member staking pool. Um, now that enables them to book their stay on the closer platform. Um, and then the thing that we do is uh, we then attribute um, a proof of presence for every night spent on the project. And so that becomes your kind of booking on chain mechanism. Um, and yeah, and then this proof of presence is kind of a, a Lego block that we intend to develop other functionality on top of. Uh, so the first thing that we are doing currently is um, we're building integration to Snapshot, which means that you will be able to use uh, this proof of presence, so the proof that you spent some time in our village uh, as a weight on the votes that you're going to be casting. So instead of using, for, for example, quadratic funding or like quadratic uh, voting, sorry, or conviction voting and so on, this creates a new kind of uh, model where it's based on how much time you actually spent in a village um, that you can make decisions for the village and decide how the village uh, is operated and, and evolved. And in our case, like some of the decisions that we take the, or that we would be taking very soon once this proof of presence goes live is um, decisions on the master plan. Um, and we have a quarterly uh, roadmap proposal that gets approved by the DAO and that kind of decides how much budget we want to spend. Um, it's also about adding or removing members from the DAO um, and this kind of, uh, like all these kind of decisions. Uh, another thing that we um, experimented with this summer was um, we have a stewarding model. So every three months, we have a new team of stewards that are actually operating TDF. And actually, we've been experimenting already with distributing um, some of like a, a share of the income to the stewards uh, based on their presence on the ground. So it's just nice to see that, yeah, like we can actually use this as like a Lego block to build other things on top of it. Um, and some other things that we've been thinking about, uh, dreaming about a bit is um, if, if you build a refi protocol, so regenerative finance protocol that rewards people for uh, behaviors that are good for the planet, uh, which there's multiple protocols that are trying to do, uh, you could reward, for example, uh, people burning carbon credits, meaning that they they get out, out of the market because that's a regenerative behavior. It takes carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, but another way could be, for example, to reward people who spend most of the time in regenerative villages. Um, so you could simply distribute um, some kind of income to people who have uh, this proof of presence. So this is a little bit something that we're thinking about. Uh, and also building connections with refi protocols like Regen Network or Open Forest, um, so that you can actually track on chain how much regeneration you do. It's on YouTube, actually. Hopefully, this can go on YouTube. Um, but it... no. um, so yeah, so you, uh, tracking your basically your regeneration and your impact uh, through a protocol like Open Forest or Regen Network, um, which measures uh, 
uh, well, you can measure any kind of kind of ecosystem benefits that you're creating as a village. But the most basic one being uh, carbon storage. So when you take carbon out of the atmosphere and you put it into the ground because you're growing forest, etc., that's creating benefits for the rest of the planet. And therefore, the rest of the planet can also invest in what you're doing. And then you as a village, you're then able to redistribute those benefits down to the members based on how much time they actually spend in your village. Um, that's just some things that we're dreaming about a little bit. So I'll show a little demo of the current uh, bookings with uh, tokens. Um, so, I mean, it's very simple and this is like how we want to design this platform to really be super minimalistic and yeah, just be straight to the point. Um, so you can, uh, so as a member of the village, I can basically just um, connect my wallet. You can see that I have 70 test TDF tokens here. I'm able to uh, do a transaction to actually provide to, to create the booking. And And then what, uh, what the smart contract is doing right now is uh, it's minting the proof of presence for you. Uh, so basically storing on chain the fact that you booked some nights um, in this village and that when you show up at the village, now the admin of the village can say, oh, okay, this person has it. And maybe you even get super fancy and you build that into some kind of uh, automated check-in system and you can just use some kind of badge to uh, go into the village. Um, yeah, that's it. And so right now we got, um, last year we got a grant from Regen Network to start developing some of this tech. Uh, this year we got a bit of a grant from Climate Collective, which is a branch from uh, Celo. Um, and yeah, we are looking for more developers and people to contribute to the DAO and to just co-create this uh, common tech stack. So I'll open it up to questions. And there's a question from Gaia Union about how much is one token and how can you earn them? Uh, well, I can maybe just share screen for that again. I have a Figma file. This is our green paper for TDF that's in the process of being created. But the way that we calculated things is as uh, the initial price of the token, we take all of the expected costs, so land acquisition, construction, legal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, which comes to roughly three and a half million euros in our case. And then we just divide it by the total number of nights available. Um, so, so the total number of nights that are available, well, this is the total number of tokens essentially. In our case, it's uh, for each three. So if you wanna have a private room with bathroom, it costs you two tokens per night. If you want to have a private studio, it's three tokens per night, a house is five tokens. Our glamping is one token, and then we multiply that total number by 365. That gives you a total of 15,870 tokens. Then there's like a few more details coming out of that, but that's kind of the raw and the rough idea. Um, and then another thing to note is that this is the initial price. So the initial price starts out at uh, 220 euros more or less when you do this division, three and a half million uh, divided by. 15,870 uh, minus 20% that are locked for community contributions. Um, but then because of the price of the token rise over time, that means that we end up with a liquid reserve at the end of the project, uh, which can then be used for things like um, construction budget overrunning cost, which is probably gonna happen. Uh, or if we have excess cash by the end of the project can be used to maybe start a second village or buy a boat or whatever the DAO decides to do. At that point, it's all collectively decided. Hi, Sam. Hi, uh, Kretzen. Uh, okay. Nice to see you. Yeah, kind of. OK. Um, nice to see you. I'm, I'm very glad the project is continuing. I have TDF, and it's amazing. Uh, I just had a question around the uh, possible best scenarios, given that we are uh, assisting to very not uh, optimistic things happening. 
like with other cash and all this kind of um is the system designed uh keeping in consideration that uh, could completely with uh, uh, stuff or is very dependent on a lot of um, smart contracts so if there's a problem this it's a problem for the whole uh Organization, no? I mean, now are you are you planning about this or or what? Sorry, I ask the other question. It's a little hard to hear you. I think you're you're saying if there's like a problem with the legal structure of the token, is that it? Wait, I try to speak. Okay, now you should hear me better. I'm much better. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, just imagining. Uh, Bad scenarios for the future in which the system is going and is very well designed and there is all these smart contracts and blockchains that are used to manage uh, the operations and the um, bookings and so on in case some of the blockchains involved get uh, I, I don't I mean I don't see how they could be shut down but if there is problems on the side of regulations and we have to radically change what we use because some coins or some tools becomes illegal, for example, is it this uh, considered in the like, okay, if yeah. this happened, what do we do? It's a lunar punk uh, perspective, but <laughs> want to do this question. I mean, essentially like the blockchain is just a database, right? And it just says who has how many tokens and and now what we're just adding is uh, who spent how much time in the project. So, you know, if, if Celo goes down one day or whatever, you, I mean, you can just, um, you just, and just give that DAO's authority, um, the, the space. <clears throat> um, yeah. And, and that's kind of also, yeah, I guess like one big, uh, model is that it's a uh, one way only into the common to this nonprofit, and actually we cannot sell the land. So the non uh, if we want to get rid of the land, it's and that means that it creates a lot of uh, safety for token buyers because they know that uh, once the land is, it's locked in there for forever, as much as whatever can mean. Um, and how this is through either, um, Voting some changes through the DAO or electing a new DAO would be kind of the exit strategy. If, for example, the DAO doesn't work out, if there's issues in the community or whatever, then you can to to govern what's there. But you're always going to have to follow the regenerative man, stewardship principles. Um, I wonder if it's just me. Is everyone else getting you clear? Um, let me know if you can hear well, but your thumbs up. If you can't hear well, thumbs down. Okay, it might just be me then. That's unfortunate. Um, sending it back over to you, Sam. Sorry for interrupting. Oh, no worries. Uh, Walter, you have a question? <clears throat> yeah, uh, what you presented done way more uh, thinking about everything uh, than where we're at. But I had a question. So if somebody well, I don't have quite enough background about your uh, project, right? So if, say, a, a young person with, without many assets wanted, wanted to join your, uh, you know, it, uh, the, the model for, for guests and how much they pay for, for night, how, how does somebody uh, actually become a community member or is that, that not part of your, your model? Yeah, so I mean, essentially we're setting up a DAO as a governance mechanism. So if you want to give out tokens to someone for some uh, for whatever reason, you can. Uh, and so for example, all the work that is being done currently at, we reward people in tokens for the most part. Um, so that means that if you if you don't have assets and you want to be part of this village, uh, you might be able to come in and actually 
do some work for the village. And this way you'd be collecting tokens over time for whatever it is that you're doing. So that's one way to, to earn your tokens instead of having to put in financial capital. Okay, thanks, Jim. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, so I think just to clarify the TDF token, one TDF token gives you the right to one night per year. Right, it's not it's not a one time thing, so you don't have yeah. to. Okay, and that that means if I hold a, a TDF token and let's say I hold ten tokens because I don't want to stay just one night, but this year I can't make it. Um, can I delegate uh, this year's um, ten nights to Julio? So right now um, we are only focusing on on this very simple member staking pool. So where you stake your tokens in in this pool, and then you can get the utility as a member. Uh, it's possible that we would create other pools in the future where you would be able to stake them in there and give the utility to other members. Um, but also, I mean, you could you could still use that system, and you know you can. Hmm. Send your tokens to someone else, and then they can use it, and then they can send it back to use it. Yeah, after for example, okay, right. you want to, to but like if you have these different pools, I guess, then you could also introduce a tax, let's say. Um, and then a second question. <clears throat> okay, so so you split basically by by doing that um, tokenizing the the starting costs. You split the starting costs over um, over rights over over full access, uh, full um, full usage of all space over all the year, right? Um, yeah. But how are stewards being paid? Like, or or how do you um, you know how, how do you cover operating costs um, and so on? Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, I didn't specify it um, in in the presentation, I guess. But actually, besides uh, having to spend tokens, you also have to pay some kind of utility fee, um, which covers like the operating expenses. So like energy bills, uh, if we have monthly salaries, whatever, uh, that would be something that you'd pay on top of that uh, when, you, when you do your booking. Uh, but the goal is that, I mean, because it's divided by whoever stays there, I mean, that's like, you're not paying any profits when you set party and so on. So it's literally just uh, operating. And then our goal is also as a village, we want to, um, over time, we want to build up our income stream so that it's not only from guests, but it's also from, for example, the restaurant or any kind of product that we create in the village. And we want to have more exports than imports, basically, which would mean that at some point those Thanks. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. And I have the, like, do you have a model of how, how do you plan to, for example, people that go contribute on a specific project, they might get rewarded. Like there will be always like that space for kind of volunteer or exchange because for example, when, when, when one person goes to volunteer and does eight hours or six hours, these spaces, they would probably get, need at least one to stay the to cover their night, but also their food. Like, do you have any more information about what's the model around the in the, the exchange? With so Oscar? now for us during the build phase, um, you can already come either as a guest or as a volunteer. If you come as a volunteer right now, you have to contribute three, four hours of work per day. Uh, and you pay 10 euros to cover for like food expenses. Um, or you can come as a guest and you pay uh, the full price. Um, in the future, once we're gonna have the, the token system, basically the idea is that um, priority is gonna be given to the members. So all the accommodation and so on, the priority is given to the members. But if we have occupancy, uh, we might like accept either paying guests or volunteers that want to contribute some time. Um, and then on top of that, in the model, we also reserve, uh, I think it's 15% of the occupancy for uh, residents. Um, so for example, this summer we hosted an, an art fair and we had four artists residents who came to create uh, value for the project. And right now we have an engineer who is staying and working on gray water system and that creates value for the uh, 
has, is it? but it's no exchange of financial value. Thanks. And the last question, how many places do you uh, functioning? Uh, villages, you mean, or? Yes. This is the first. We're building the prototype, yeah. Uh, just building it, okay. So you have to earn. Yeah, yeah, we are receiving people, but we are still building it. So it's, uh, I guess I could have shown some pictures of it, but it's uh, it's called traditional dream factory. It's an old chicken farm in Portugal. It's a thousand five hundred square meters of building uh, so we are repurposing and renovating and uh, building out like a co-living space and maker space and co-working space and planting a food forest in at the moment. Um, so you can come and stay already, but the current accommodation is glamping, glamping tents. Uh, and we are hoping that um, that we'll be doing our token uh, in order to raise the funds to do the proper construction starting around February. And by proper construction, I mean building out the co-living space, which is gonna be 14 suites with a bedroom bathroom. Um, yeah, that's like part of the construction plan. And I see a question from Jeff. Are you planning on extending this token model to multiple eco villages? If so, how would token insurance expand for additional capacity? Yes, thank you, good question. Uh, yeah, we plan on uh, internally within the OASA network, we, pl we plan on creating 12 of these villages around the world. Uh, and we have a very ambitious goal of protecting 100,000 hectares. We want to to be a showcase for how we can actually achieve regenerative living in different climates and conditions and so on. Um, so that's really our objective. And this is why we see ourselves as a refi protocol because we want to enable Web3 to fund uh, the conservation of these spaces and then give access to these 12 villages around the world um, to be living there. Um, and yeah, and we see a little bit of token, our token economics as uh, you can have an expanding economy, which means that you have more members that want to come in and stay. And in that case, you would be able to build more, uh, more rooms or more houses or whatever, more occupancy. And that's how you can issue more tokens to, to do that. Uh, and then you can have a retracting economy where you want to, where you have less and less members, uh, people are exiting the network. And in that case, we would want to find other ways to utilize our assets, like whether it's leasing it out to other types of projects, uh, whether it's forestry or whatever, uh, as long as it respects the regenerative land use, you could do that. Absolutely beautiful, Sam. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments? Um, I do have something to add to this. So you were talking about um, traditional dream factory. Or would it be under Awasa or closer? <laughs> I'm not sure. Awasa is the one that would be extending the model to 12 villages, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, so what I'd like to plant the idea of in this alliance, what we're doing with projects is you know, all of our projects have that idea of taking our model and duplicating it to lots of places, right? Um, and then I think we all share the model that each one will be a little bit diverse. Well, that is us. We already did that. So we already have 13, 14 villages. Um, and not coincidentally, and we can definitely dive more into this, um, and it's probably just the, how it's coming together. The model you put together and shared is right along how we were thinking of doing it here for the Regen Campus. So mm -hmm. it's like, we're already extending the model to begin with. So that's what I'm proposing here in this alliance is that we're finding the shared infrastructure to launch it. And then we start with 13. We don't start our project, extend the model, but we're doing that with 13, then to 33, and then to 144, et cetera, right? Uh, but we're doing that then as an alliance. So uh, I'd love your reflections on that and anyone else's reflections on that before I then introduce some of the other alliance projects and kind of fold in that thinking. Yeah, I mean, as I think, you know, we're not going to limit ourselves to 12 villages. Uh, like, that's not how we're going to be regenerating the planet. We're going to be regenerating the planet by having thousands and thousands and thousands of these villages all over. Um, the only reason that we put like 12 as kind of a, a goal for OASA is that we want, don't want to become this giant entity that's just trying to build all of the villages in the world. 
we just want to limit ourselves to showcasing how we can work in different kind of climates and extending that to extend a tribe, which is a community of people that shares the values that, that we have um, around the world. And then we, the reason why we created Closer is so that other people who are not part of OSI network can take the model, create own villages, and iterate on it. Yeah, so I guess more tangibly what I was inviting is that are you open to existing projects as part of the alliance that are like, yep, love that tokenomics model. We would just like to adopt that and join that network. Are you saying, yeah, we're open to other projects doing that with us right now or not? So we are open to having, I mean, well, first we have to <laughs> actually be able to finish building up all these tech and so on. And then anyone will be able to, to use it um, uh, and you can create yourself. I guess the separation between using a token model and being part of the OSA network is more of a, a legal one. It's like, uh, are you willing to give up ownership of your land and put it into, uh, into the OASA uh, kind of legal entity, which is uh, emulating this kind of land trust rules? Uh, and if you are, then... Um, then you can start to consider it. Uh, and so basically what you get is you, you give up the, you, yeah, you give up the land title, you put, into, in, you put it into the nonprofit, and then you get tokens in exchange. Um, this is what I'm going through right now. I purchase and donating it to the nonprofit and in exchange. Like, um, so yeah, I mean, we'll be open to having other people starting village. I think one second condition is we might want people to actually come and spend some time at CDF, uh, actually like really working with the people on the ground so you can really learn what is our culture, how do we do things, uh, so we can really have this alignment. And it's just because the whole point of the of villages that have a similar culture and kind of way of doing things so that would be a little bit of a requirement, uh, but we're still we're still refining it. Um, I had interest from quite a few landowners that actually want to create these kind of spaces. Um, for now, we are not really opening up that, that door yet. Um, the best way, if you wanted to, would be to come and actually spend time at TDF, live with us, build with us, um, overlap in values that we would actually want to. Yeah, to basically share uh, share our lives and and build villages together and live together. Um, but yeah, and then anyone that wants to copy our models, they're more than welcome to, and that's why we're open sourcing it and putting it to closer. And yeah, and all of our legal frameworks and so on for creating OASA, uh, we can also give you access to that. Um, it 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 costs us roughly like thirty thousand euros in legal expenses to set this up. Uh, and now that enables us to do it anywhere in the world. Um, but that's kind of what you have to go through if you want to be able to launch your own token and so on, like in the in the proper way. Hopefully that should go down over time. But that that's kind of the main downside of setting up your own network is that you have to go through this legal process and yeah, define a lot of these models yourself. Um, so that's a little bit uh, the distinction here, I think. So would it be fair to summarize it as Awasa is the tribe, the legal entity, and the family. Closer is the tool set that other people can use to duplicate if they would like to. And TDF, yeah. one of the projects, and there's going to be 12 of those. Exactly. Absolutely love the model. That's exactly what I wanted you to share. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts, questions, reflections before we go forward? Jeff was asking about um, liquidity in the message in the chat. Well, that's right, Jeff, you can come on and just ask it. And I would like you to have a small dialogue about uh, community currency flows, <laughs> if we can. Uh, and if we can keep that to 10 minutes, that'd be awesome. But I'd love to have that um, if you wanted to also plug in, Jeff. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I love the model. Um, super cool to see. Um, one of the, um, I guess, research primitives that, that I've been working on in a number of different projects from the common stack to um, hollow chain and, and a couple of other um, sort of how we can deploy this sort of um, 
actually it kind of delves more into a mutual credit model. So it's moving away from sort of like token-based issuance and more towards producer issuance. So this was my, um, my first question about issuing credits um, in, you know, starting with one eco village where you have sort of a, a bulk issuance. And then if another uh, village comes along, you have another bulk issuance. Um, this strikes me as sort of like a manual way to have a smooth issuance. So as opposed to an ICO where you have a token issuance event, um, one of the tools that, that we've been researching is uh, like automated market makers and all of their sort of various forms um, so that you can have a token issuance mechanism rather than a token issuance event, um, which really sort of smooths out the supply, um, the supply of these tokens rather than saying, okay, there's 1 million, now there's 2 million, now there's 3 million, for example, um, you just sort of have this market mechanism that people can input um, their, their hard assets, their collateral, whether that's dollars or die or, or seeds or whatever. Um, and then it issues the sort of corresponding amount of tokens out the other side. So it's kind of like a vending machine um, rather than having a one token issuance event. It's just having a, a continuous or, or an ATM, really. Uh, you put your money in, you get out your token of interest and that grows the, the, the supply of that native token and vice versa. When people put their tokens back in, whether that's redeeming them for a night stay or um, selling them back to the AMM, uh, their, their money comes out and that token is burned out of existence. So it kind of creates these more like dynamic um, breathing supply tokens so that you can have an increase in token supply when there's an increase in demand and a decrease in token supply when there's a decrease in demand without necessarily harming your the economics of your, um, of your token or the price for that matter. Um, yeah, so that was, that was my question or, around the, the um, uh, issuance and also sort of liquidity. Sorry, sorry, go ahead before I jump into liquidity, if you had a, a comment on that. Yeah, I mean, thank you for, for sharing. And this is something that we're actually diving in right now. Like we've been exploring this idea of creating kind of a bonding curves that would automate the, the liquidity of the project. Um, whereas the idea is that we, we sell the tokens up until the go live event. The go live simply means that we raise enough money to do all the construction. And past that point, the money goes into a kind of liquid reserve that you can then cash in and out from. Uh, so it's, it becomes automated. Uh, so yeah, that's 100% something that we're exploring right now. Um, and yeah, if you would wanna join our token engineering group, we're working on it right now. So it sounds like you might have some good ideas for it. Um, if you're down, we can have a call about it. Um, yeah, so that, that's a little bit what we're exploring, kind of potentially setting up a bonding curve to, to automate it. Cool. Um, I'm also curious, just actually off that chart, do you see the um, the to the price of the token increasing such that potentially it, it makes the network um, less uh, appealing at some point? I'm just just sort of seeing that that sharp spike in price towards the end, um, and it reminds me of sort of like Ethereum mainnet, how it's almost like you know it's the downtown core, but it's so super expensive that everyone's going to the suburbs and all these side ch side chains because they can afford the gas there, um, and I'm wondering if these sort of like um, combining the and uh, you know the, the price supply graph of the bonding curve when you start to get up here in the price does this make the whole network less usable for you know especially these these young nomads who don't have resources and I'm curious alternative pricing mechanisms that can sort of maintain price parity with a growing production of the network without the price going like this and suddenly making it um, unaffordable for people to participate if it's a wildly successful project yeah, I mean, that's a great question. That's, that's something we're exploring right now. Um, I think like there's a differentiation between owning the token and coming and staying at TDF also. Um, when you when you buy the token, you give support to the project, uh, but it's only when you become a member uh, that you actually get the utility of the token. So there's that distinction. Uh, and the project is still able to accept other people to come and stay there. So you can still have residents and volunteers and this kind of things. Uh, so you you do have other ways. It's just a way to create some appeal for the for the token buyers to give to give them the utility of the space. Um, but yeah, I mean it's not it's not fully solved, and that's really what we want to figure out the next months is like finishing up this kind of white paper on tokenomics, uh, and we're hoping to launch a pre-sale during East uh, East Lisbon at the end of October. So yeah, if you wanna uh, if you wanna have more detailed conversations about it, happy to 
to uh, to do that. Cool. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely be interested in in that. Um, so another question I had was around um, liquidity for the TDF token. So, and I like this idea of like kind of separating, like there's almost a two tier system. There's like value producers or, or value creators, and then there's speculators. And in my mind, the speculators are sort of like second-class citizens. We let them play in these ecosystems because they provide liquidity, they provide capital, and they may you know claim some profits, but we wanna make sure that they're not free riding this commons and, and extracting the surplus profit and thus, you know, kind of putting the um, the pressure on real value producers and, and extracting away that um, that surplus. So I'm, I'm curious how the it, it, you're talking about um, using a bonding curve for for token yeah. issuance. Yeah, really like cool. The interesting because Jeff, yeah. you're incredible and awesome, and I want to let you keep going, but I want to simplify that. <laughs> sure. You said that for a lot of people aren't necessarily economists. So I think what you're asking is we're creating tokens for two different forms of value. Um, one, the people who want to speculate, i.e. the ones that are sitting there on a computer and they're like, hey, we love these projects. I probably will never visit, but I think really great things are happening at that project. I want to buy some tokens because I think it's really popular. I want to support what they're doing, et cetera. So those are people who you know speculate on the price going up and down. So you're saying, let's let them be able to play that game and get some value out of speculating, but not that they're the ones extracting all the value, which is how our capitalistic markets work, where the speculators end up getting all the value where the people who trade money all day are the richest people and banks are the biggest buildings. So you're saying, how do we create a system that doesn't repeat that problem and that really supports the people on the ground, right? Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm just wanting to, it's a big topic and it's really important. So, yeah. So I'm just going to give a couple of ideas that we've been playing with uh, to kind of help that. Uh, well, one is that uh, we give governance to proof of presence, not to token holders. So you can't just be aware by all the tokens and make the decisions. You actually have to come and spend enough time in the village. So that kind of helps the governance side of things. Uh, the second thing is we would like, but we still want to be able to, for example, attract impact investors or people that want to be able to support the project more than the amount of nights that they intend on uh, staying. So for that, we've been thinking a little bit about uh, kind of like a mortgage pool, um, where it's basically you, the investor buys up the tokens, uh, puts them into this pool, which is kind of functions as a, an exit to commons where the members are able to buy those tokens over time, paying whatever interest on, on that. So kind of like a bank would do. Um, so that's one mechanism. Uh, but yeah, we're open for, for other suggestions. Cool. Well, one of the other patterns that I've seen that's really interesting is to sort of only allow redemption of the token back to the bonding curve for people who have earned those tokens. So whether that's um, actually, it's, it's interesting you have the proof of presence for the individual. Maybe there's also uh, proof of hosting for the, the eco village because the eco village is kind of the one that's redeeming the token um, for the night stay and thus producing value in the eco village, providing a, a place for the nomad to, to lay their head, for example. Um, so I'm curious how the um, sort of bonding curve can be configured so that the only people who can redeem uh, the token for the hard assets in, in reserve are the people who have earned them producing value according to the network. So whether that's um, doing work on the in the eco village or spending a night there, then the eco village can redeem that credit for hard assets if it so chooses. Um, but this also limits the ability for speculators to sort of free ride the value accumulation um, because they can come in, but they can't necessarily come out unless they've done the thing that the DAO asks you to do, which in this case is um, provide lodging or, or do work in the eco village. I'm curious to chat more with you about sort of how the, the bonding curve entry and exit can be configured or access controlled to ensure that the people doing what the DAO values are getting the reward and not uh, the, the sort of speculators and, and wash traders. Um, so yeah. may I just uh, jump in quickly as I've discussed this with Jeff, it helps to understand that there are also secondary markets on which speculators could still sell. Because otherwise, if a speculator can only buy but never sell, you won't have any speculators, right? So in the secondary market, they can still find someone they can sell it to that maybe has the right to redeem, but they don't have a right to redeem um, with the bonding curve with the primary issuer. Hmm. 
right. so that comes to my second question about essentially exchange liquidity. Um, so how do existing TDF token holders um, trade or exchange those? And actually, I'm kind of curious how that works in, in the Seeds ecosystem as well, because as far as I can see from the sort of few times I've jumped in, it seems like um, Seeds is a large liquidity clearinghouse, like the Seeds um, project is a large clearinghouse for projects that want to exchange their seeds for, for example, US dollars or any other token to go and then do the work that they propose to the seeds now. So I'm curious if that sort of follows the same model that um, the project would be sort of the central clearinghouse for um, people looking to get into or, or out of the token, or I feel like this is also an area bonding curves could, could be an interesting uh, addition. I, I think like, uh, the, the, I mean, I think the primary reason why, uh, like how we are kind of tackling that is just by creating economic incentives. Uh, well, by by not creating uh, economic incentives for speculators so much, uh, because I mean, if if all of the proceeds from so for example, if you have uh, an exit tax on the bonding curve, uh, five or ten percent, whatever it is, that means that you keep replenishing the treasury right from from people speculating on the project, and then that treasury is actually controlled by uh, people who are actually staying in the village. Uh, so actually that uh, treasury gets spent on whether it's growing a forest or building a village or whatever. So it, it rewards people who are actually using the asset rather than just the speculators. I think that's kind of the primary mechanism. I think creating really complex entry and exits from the bonding curve seems, I don't know, it kind of makes me question why you would want a bonding curve in the first place. Um, because then you could just have everything on secondary markets. Uh, I feel like just by creating the right economic incentives that actually we're incentivizing regeneration, we're incentivizing creation of accommodation for members, uh, and and the people who actually stay in the village decide how the treasury gets spent, whether it's you know buying a boat or creating art or whatever is actually creating value for the community, and I guess decided on by people who actually stay in the village. So I think it's kind of already solved. I mean, I'm happy to to have you convince me that it should be different, but uh, yeah. It strikes me as very similar models. One just seems more um, automated or, or smart contract like mm, algorithmized as opposed to doing it um, through a manual like treasury allocation. So I, I, I think the model sounds good to me. Um, and this is, it's, it, you're right, it rhymes very much. I think the question is just how much of it is sort of automated in a smart contract and how much is manually deployed by, you know, regular institutional policy making sort of thing. Cool. Which is what I love. So that's a distinction we talk about a lot here is what's the difference between a DAO where things are autonomous, which is what Jeff was saying, the smart contract handles it all. People come in and out, it's automated. There's a tax that's taken, et cetera. You don't need anyone voting or anything like that. Versus kind of like a do with an H human, which is the humans are voting and they're manually doing a governance process to issue, redeem, et cetera, tokens. So that's kind of the different, one of the major differences, I think, between maybe those two lexicon, those two words, you know, DAOs are automating it, while do's are kind of putting humans at the center of a governance process, right? Does that make sense? And are we? Cool. Um, I, I love this conversation. <laughs> But I feel like it probably needs its own uh, episode where we really dive deep into tokenomics and give enough context for village builders to really benefit from this dialogue. Because um, I think right now we're getting into the weeds, and <laughs> which is great. Um, so I want to go back up to like a 15,000 foot view and introduce you, Jeff, because we haven't really seen you in the series yet. Um, and common stack and the kind of the work you're doing. So if you could give me, give us rather, uh, maybe like a three to five minute overview of common stack, the work you guys have been doing, how it relates to, you know, villages, projects on the ground, doing regenerative work and how they could benefit from the tools that you guys are deploying. How does that work? Cool, so I'll send it back over to you, Jeff. Sure, sounds good. Um, I have, a couple of slides. I may, I, I feel like a few of these tools are a little more relevant than others. 
Let me share my screen here if I'm able to and look through kind of a couple of different slides. Um, I apologize if this is somewhat um, all over the place. Didn't actually have this um, prepared for discussion beforehand. So um, long story short, Stack is basically proposed to be a, a tech stack for the commons. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different components that can be fit together in various um, configurations. There are some funding components. So this is, we were just talking about the, the bonding curves and in particular, a, a certain type of bonding curve. We started calling it the augmented bonding curve. Not many people understood that. We started market makers, automated market maker for the commons. Uh, so includes tools for, in other words, if a um, but before it's completed, where does the money go? If we send the money straight to the people and they run off to Central America because global DAO, um, we have no idea. So we need some sort of accountability over fund management, escrow, um, governance. Uh, I think conviction voting was was mentioned briefly. This is real time voting tool that's enabled by blockchains because until you know the the every fourth year to uh, exert our preference we can now do it in real time with tokens and get a much richer sort of signal processing um, input from the citizens of a nation or a, a village we can go as small as we need to um, and of course having feedback for um, those villagers or those commoners is also really important so how do they understand what's going on in their system and uh, and act on it um, in ways that that make sense for the DAO. Ooh, uh, as a authoritarian facilitator, can I have you go back to that previous slide? Because <laughs> sure. I, I want to I ground this in a little bit of our work. For example, conviction voting could be how we determine what season we're in. Um, so we can kind of real time sense from a collective group of people where they think they collectively are. So for example, if everyone feels like we need to be in a spring season where we're doing onboarding, the new people would be coming in and signaling, hey, we want to be in a spring season. We're needing onboarding stuff, you know, and then that could shift the protocol over to a spring season or our community over if enough people did that. And that could happen real time. So instead of every three months, we say, hey, let's come together and think about what season we're in. What you're saying is real time. The community can constantly be giving feedback. And as those preferences shift, the protocol can shift. In this case, the protocol could say, you know, when spring comes, we send money to these organizations, which are the spring organizations. And these are organizations doing onboarding and such, which is different from the summer organizations, which are doing on the ground, you know, festivals, planting gardens, that work. So what we've said is you can have a protocol that automatically shifts how those funds move based on real time conviction of people, you know, signaling where the protocol should be. So that makes sense. So this is how region civics as an ecosystem could actually adopt some of these common stack tools to start doing our decentralized governance, right? Projects on the ground could use augmented bonding curves in order to raise funds in an equitable way that benefits the commons, right? Um, and then you also have the giveth that DAP where philanthropists in our community can come in and actually donate to our projects and Right, so I'm, I'm plugging these pieces together. Cool, totally. so you keep going. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and of course that, that- We can also show all our projects and the good work we're doing on the ground. <laughs> Sorry, last piece. Yeah, totally. Um, so those, those four pieces are really just a much larger toolkit um, and a, in any one place. Um, a lot of the tools we built ended up in One Hive Gardens, um, which I think I saw mentioned earlier, which is awesome. Um, but also, I think these are, you know, very um, uh, replicable primitives, you know, conviction voting is essentially just the charging up and discharging um, that ways, um, the way we use it in conviction voting, it kind of simulates neurons in the brain. So neurons when they fire, I mean, we have distributed consensus between the neurons in our brain, there's no um, president neuron that makes all the decisions, it's just an interconnected network, uh, and there are action potentials between each of these, and when a neuron fills up to its um, action potential, it fires, uh, and of course, this is how we have thought through the brain. So this is sort of the same idea with conviction voting, is that it's a, um, actually, I wonder if I have a slide in here, uh, I do. Um, so conviction voting is quite similar, where sort of the proposal fills up like a battery or like a cup, 
with the aggregate conviction of everybody. And when it hits the threshold, the funds pass and the proposal um, begins or, or work begins on the proposal, for example. Um, so very similar to um, right next to it is a, is a picture of um, the action potential in a neuron. Um, yeah, so you pretty um, there. Uh, let me go back to where were we? Um, the common stack. So a large um, component of tools, um, they can be combined in different ways. Actually, I think I'll just go to this one because this one makes the most sense. Um, this is the, the system diagram of a cyber physical commons. Uh, so we have the bonding curve is here. Let me go back a slide so you can see a bit clearer. The bonding curve is here. Conviction voting is here. Engine, and this produces uh, work to be done now. If we were to simplify this a bit, this is where tokens are purchased. This is where funding sort of flows through the network. Um, the decision making over what proposals the community will carry out, payment and escrow, the work produced, and then revenue from that work, of course, can, can feed back in uh, to sort of like viable systems models. This is like a, a community uh, cell almost. This is like an infrastructure, an economic and decision-making infrastructure for a community, which is also why I think it's important as we scale these systems that we turn these into sort of easily replicable um, systems where we um, automate as much of the economic policy. Of course, in context, there's no one solution for all um, community economies, but we can basically turn these into uh, little um, cells that take in um, sustenance in the form of investment or donations, it pumps that around, it makes decisions over how it will act, it digests that uh, value into outputs, maybe open source code, which can be um, turned into revenue of various kinds and fed back into the organism. Um, so that's sort of the, the high level um, vision behind the common stack is to create sort of these economic um, games or, or economic and governance games over shared resource allocation and um, uh, achieving shared goals. Um, some of the, I mean, this definitely goes down the rabbit hole. I don't have to go into it now, um, but some of these tools actually help to limit volatility in crypto markets, which I think is one of the biggest um, damaging effects that we see in token ecosystems today is that the price goes way up and the price goes way down. And this is just way too volatile for, you know, normal people to put their money on the line. Or even, you know, if I'm really a fan of TDF and I want to buy uh, some of these tokens to participate, but I waited too long and now they're 10 times more expensive. And now I'm priced out of this eco village network, which is really a shame. The goal is to provide, you know, um, reasonable cost, um, cost of living, cost of um, participation in new economies, et cetera. Um, but a lot of these sort of token volatility dynamics kind of preclude or at least create this, this early entry, um, you know, opportunity that later purchasers are, are kind of priced out. Um, so what some of these tools do is actually limit the volatility. It's like a regenerative braking, you know, in, in e-cars when you're driving and you put on the brakes, there's actually, it takes the friction and the heat from that and it feeds it back into the battery. Um, so that's essentially what some of these tools do, um, particularly the, the commons market maker. It has a primary market and a secondary market. And when you play between these markets, um, you can see this is sort of a stylized example. This blue line would be the, the market price um, and the red lines are the sort of primary market buy and sell price. And you can see if the secondary market tries to go above or below the primary market, you get this sort of uh, dampening or breaking effect on uh, the volatility of the price. And it actually creates funds to, that flow to the common pool through the um, sort of entry exit taxes or um, the speculative um, tax that, that Samuel was also talking about. So um, I'm going one, to facilitate and plug in again because yeah, uh, please I'll simplify this if I can. <laughs> uh, so we had talked about plugging into speculators. So we're trying to attack, attach ourselves to those secondary markets, which have a ton of value. And how do we jujitsu move, so to speak, that value to regenerate our planet? But then how do we avoid repeating it? Because what crypto really did is it created a whole lot of people staring at charts day trading and addicted to looking at the price graphs because their emotional roller coaster of, ooh, I made a bunch of money, I lost a bunch of money, and that freaking whirlwind of life. That's incredibly degenerative. So how do we jujitsu move markets to redirect that value without succumbing to it? You know, How do we stare into the abyss without falling into it? So I think that's what you're trying to answer here is you, you can create more stability 
in that secondary market while still providing it. Um, so we can in that way re-leverage the value from the secondary markets, which are people trading. Um, I don't know if I'm actually making it simpler. I think I did, so I'll stop there. Jeff, is that correct? <laughs> that the real idea is to try to still be able to attach to markets without getting ourselves stuck into the bear market, bull, bull market, crash, et cetera, cycles. Yeah, awesome. That's exactly it, yeah. We're trying to figure out how do we couple, um, you know, community currencies that are, you know, locally valued with dollars, which are globally valued, but generally, and I mean, anyone who's in the community currency space, if you connect those things, you see people escaping the, the soft money, the local money for the hard money. So you see this sort of value slide. And I mean, if you look at a lot of different tokens, good dollar or circles or like all of these, especially UBI tokens that are sort of issued and given to everybody. And then what does everybody do? They, they take them and they sell them. And so you see this kind of continual price slide. Um, so what these tools are trying to do is say, how can we create a better coupling between the community currency that is production backed and maybe good for night stays at an eco village with dollars in a way that can provide liquidity, but doesn't just create this sort of continuous price slide um, or, or value extraction of speculators for the most part. Um, so yeah, very, very much so. Um, I don't know that I need to go too much more into detail. Um, I mean, a couple of analogies, you know, we look at the token price and we say up is good, down is bad. Um, this is generally like, you know, when, when the bull market is happening, everyone's happy. When the bear market is happening, everybody's sad. Um, how can we create economic systems that are anti-fragile to these ups and downs? And what if we looked at the token price as a pump? And when it goes up, that's good. When it goes down, that's fine. Because really what's interesting is that the up, down, up, down produces money for the common pool. And this is, I think what, what Sam touched on is that you know, all of this is essentially feeding the project treasury, which allows the project to be more, uh, more productive, produce more value for um, the people that are involved. Um, or if we look at it as a dam, you know, you have inflows and outflows, but what happens is, you know, the, the interesting part here is that fees are generated, that the treasury is being filled up um, and that we have sort of greater um, capital efficiency in these local economies so that we don't have pure value loss um, through connecting them to, to hard currencies. Um, for example, you can have your token trading on an exchange. So when people want to speculate on it, they buy that token. Anytime they buy it or sell it, there's a small fee that's taken and given back to the community. So when you're saying when there's volatility and there's a lot of people buying and selling, you're saying that's always good because every time it's bought or sold, there's a fee taken, which comes back to the community and funds whatever you guys are funding, right? Love it. So I just dropped the link in the chat here. Um, Stephen asked for it. I apologize. This is very much a work in progress deck. It's, it's kind of a, a combination of a few different um, decks at this point, but I'm, I'm working on pulling together some of these concepts into more visual forms. Um, I don't know that there's anything super relevant here. Um, I would rather um, sort of focus on the high level concepts rather than um, getting pulled too deep into the weeds. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of interesting sort of uh, patterns going on in, in the common stack toolkit. Um, one of the things I'm most interested in is how can we deploy these primitives across multiple ecosystems, whether that's seeds, hollow chain, um, you know, local cooperatives, eco villages. Um, these, this is really sort of what's what's most interesting to me with with some of these primitives. Um, Stephen, did you have a question? I, I'm I'm really welcoming the weeds. Thanks for getting down into some of the weeds. I find them fascinating. Um, I do have a question about your conviction voting to see if I understand it. You talked about it's like a neuron when when the energy level gets up to the top and it fills the neuron, then it fires. But in the actuality of doing conviction voting in your system, what's the equivalent of that? How do you what is that threshold? How do you establish that threshold? Question. Um, so the threshold is essentially established based on how much of the common pool treasury is being requested. Um, so if there's, say, a million dollars in treasury and I'm asking for 10% um, of that, it will probably be a very high um, conviction threshold. 
compared with if I'm only asking for $20, it will be a very low conviction threshold. So um, depending on the size of the proposal, um, and actually I have a small visualization here, um, conviction voting is attempting to address sort of the attention overhead issue in DAOs. Um, and I'm sure you guys have seen this in, in seeds as the number of proposals um, increases. It's very difficult for all voters to know what's going on in every proposal. Um, so to be able to hit, hit quorum and have enough support for a proposal, you know, if you have a thousand proposals, you need a hundred stewards to read a thousand proposals. This is a, a massive um, attention cost. Um, so what con conviction voting does is it kind of increases subsidiarity in the DAO. Uh, because if you're passing a small proposal, for example, if Stephen and I wanted to uh, maybe meet for lunch and talk about seeds and expense our sandwiches, maybe. Um, it's a $20 proposal, um, you know, we might have enough tokens between us to pass that proposal ourselves. We don't need to call Reiki up in Indonesia and, and say, hey, can we, you know, pass this vote for a couple of sandwiches? Because really it shouldn't bother someone on that side of the DAO for us to pass something so small on this side of the DAO. Um, so of course, with larger proposals, you need a larger support base. So if we're spending 10% of the treasury, we probably do need to call Reiki and say, hey, we're planning some major investment over here and we want you on board. And he says, oh, I agree, or maybe I disagree. Um, and then we change our proposal a bit and we get his, his support and he puts his tokens and that allows us to pass um, sort of the threshold. So it really depends how much of the, the uh, common pool funds are being, being requested. Well, okay, thanks. I don't know how many people here are interested in the, these weeds, but I really am. Um, maybe I, I'd like to perhaps uh, offline uh, uh, meet with you and dive down this a little bit more because I'm really interested in understanding the mechanics of this, how you establish, uh, like the guy that wants a sandwich for lunch, how you get that proposal in there and, and not bother the whole ecosystem with your little sandwich for lunch uh, idea versus you know, something big and large that you're going to need maybe a 90 percent, um, you know, uh, vote share. So I'm, I'm interested in the mechanics of how you arrived at that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I can send, I believe we have a repo on conviction voting. Um, if you wanted to dive into sort of the, the modeling or the um, parameterization configuration, I can definitely send you a few links. Uh, I'll oh, drop be, one in the chat wonderful. here. Yeah. I have looked um, at studied the Aragon, some of the Aragon stuff, but I'm I'm fascinated by this particular thing because it's very real in a, in a DAO community where you, you it gets very real very fast. Uh, Stephen, I also dropped the link to a case study I wrote like two years ago about the carbon stack where I think conviction voting is also covered and the augmented bonding curve is covered quite in depth. Oh, great. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Sure, you're welcome. <clears throat> um, awesome. Yeah, I'm happy to chat more. I don't want to take up the rest of this this time. I'm sure we could chat oh, about a lot of these rabbit listen. holes, but exactly what needed to unfold. So I'm happy to take a few of them off offline. Yeah. Um, but we can take a few more still right now uh, because we're not going to have time for the other half today. So we'll just take that in the next session. That's kind of what happens, uh, which is totally fine. So does anyone else have any questions for Jeff or Common Stack or how this might weave in before I kind of plug this together? Awesome. Um, Putting it a little bit more into context, super philosophical here, we've talked sometimes about our alliance creating this metahuman. You know, so when we look at a metahuman, which is like, how do we coordinate as a whole organism? I think Jeff just really demonstrated that beautifully when you showed all the organs and kind of showed this metahuman, you know, organization that we're creating here. So I think that's one of the ideas behind this alliance itself. And just to give you a little bit more context, this isn't just about seeds. We're looking at seeds being, you know, one alliance member. Um, what we're actually doing here is this is Regen Civics. And this is more about how do we create an alliance across all of our organizations. So it's exploring, piecing a get together that metahuman, which is what you guys have been doing, which is why we're connecting and why I think we can start plugging in on a much more deeper level. Uh, one of the other reasons why Regen Civics formed just to kind of give context to these allies and what we're talking about here, is how can we collectively fundraise for the 
the task of transitioning to regenerative civilizations. So we need to fund a diversity of land-based projects, but each land-based project, they only need you know, a few million dollars that we can really do stuff with effectively. So those institutions that have hundreds of billions to deploy and want to, how do they connect with an eco-village on the ground trying to raise one or two million? And also, how does that eco-village resource fundraising? So much of our time collectively as a movement is going into chasing funds rather than aligning around collectively to raise funds as a whole ecosystem where we can raise funds from much, much deeper pockets. Very simple way of saying that. So that's what we're forming here as an alliance and reaching out to allies to build one ecosystem that we can raise with. And I think, Jeff, also what you were kind of talking about is liquidity between projects. And then how do we co-invest? Um, that's also what we're trying to explore here with Regent Civics on our token side. One side being that we can approach institutions and say, hey, invest in us as an ecosystem. So they do. Let's say they got $1 billion into the whole ecosystem here. Then our goal is, okay, how do we distribute those billion dollars across all of our alliances and our land-based projects? So this is where we can use things like conviction voting. So I'm plugging it into common stacks so people are you know, understanding where this might all land to then distribute those billion dollars across all the different allies and land-based projects in the ecosystem, right? And then as they do, then the region civics organization itself starts owning a share of all these land-based projects. So then institutions are kind of de facto buying an index fund for regenerative projects and organizations that are supporting those projects. So then we as an alliance then can go approach institutions, et cetera, that have these mandates to fund systemic change and actually raise the funds that we need to, to really- You're cutting too much. Maybe you can turn your camera off. Maybe I don't need to be doing that today then. Life's telling me that that presentation is not what we need at this moment. Um, I'll pause here because we only have about 10 minutes left. So I'd love to get some uh, reflections and feedback from some of the people on this call that haven't quite spoken yet. And actually, I'm going to call on a few of you because I'd love to. If you don't want to speak, just pass the mic, no problem. So I want to send it over to Roberto and Laura and give you guys the mic to reflect on everything you covered today. Yeah, thank you, Simon and uh, Simon and Jeff uh, for your presentations. Uh, um, already, uh, I was uh, already familiar with both uh, it's good to actually uh, to witness this conversation. I think is very important as well. Um, yeah, I really like uh, um, the 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 model uh, with Sam. We've been there discussing, so I've been digging down into it. And for me, um, for the model is the fact that the land is owned by OASA, so that then. The, the fact of speculating on a piece of token that is then um, um, uh, owned by a network requires basically this this structures that uh, that Sam has put in place. So I think interesting model. But indeed, I think that uh, uh, tracking contribution into a sort of a mutual credit way, the suggestion that Jeff gave is, I think it's very important to actually find ways that uh, we could use in um, in a mutual credit way. I think we have, uh, um, yeah, ourselves, we're interested in, uh, you know, adopting a model as well, right? So I think the question from uh, Raiki that uh, um, how, you know, the 12 eco-villages that are we already present here, are we going to, you know, how, how does these two um, initiatives, how can they merge and help each other? Rather than everybody kind of recreating its own uh, its own network of twelve eco villages, I think it's very important to ad address basically what issue, what is actually happening that if we don't actually merge, what's actually happening and and why? Aware of these conditions of what actually happens in in the dynamics. What's the birthday, Mama? Nala, you want to add something? I, I just want to thank Jeff for putting all the biomimicry models. It's it's just right. really great for people like me. Um, if I think now about conviction uh, voting, I just immediately get it. And so we really need more of these just 
for everybody to understand these pretty complicated. Um, yeah. So thank you. Ooh, um, does anyone have any reflections for Roberto and Laura, what they shared? I do. Um, one of the reflections is how do we play well together? <laughs> you, had, you had asked that um, without having to keep recreating the same wheel. Um, one way I would like to explore doing that, we're already doing it. We just did the gathering of tribes where we've been weaving together the collective awareness of our who's been playing what, which is great because a lot of us have been burning ourselves out because we got the vision of what needs to happen. We didn't see other people doing it. And we're like, crap, I have to do all of that. Um, that's been a shared experience by a lot of us. Uh, so I think what's been beautiful recently is we're all seeing each other like, great, all the pieces exist. So I think the next step for us and where Regen Civics is headed is how, how can we tangibly start building out that metahuman then? We know the other organizations, let's plug them in and say, great, you are part of this organ now, this is how we're communicating and just start building that structure. Um, so that was the, the initial impulse for Regen Civics too, is we need to start doing that. Um, and then that got really complicated too. So my open thinking here is I'm not entirely sure, but we're suggesting doing a summer camp next, next Northern Hemisphere summer. So for three months actually, and calling in a lot of people who are holding projects and seeing if they can commit to a three month period. Um, we had talked about this, how we can create kind of a collective rite of passage. Hold on, am I breaking up too much? I am? No, I'm good. Good, we're good. Um, so that was the edge of my thinking is let's come together next Northern Hemisphere summer between June and September for a three month period to really figure out this meta human that we're creating, what roles we play, plug together, decide which tools we actually end up using. Cause right now we're like kind of competing. There's so many different tools. There are some like winners necessary. It's, it's too messy. So we can come together and say, great, these are the tools that we're actually gonna use throughout our metahuman. This is how they work together and kind of go through that process of really tangibly building that. But following what we had talked about before with that rite of passage concept. So the first month we really get to kind of unpack, decide who we are, like very individual. Like how do we show up in this Renaissance? The second month then is understanding each other's real selves from that perspective, right? So this is them having that chance to really figure out what role we want to play. Then we introduce that to the community and we start from that place before we get into the th third month where we start picking the tools and finding out who's playing where and what. So then we're coming from that more like deeper, purposeful, authentic place and building from that foundation. So that's kind of the edge of my thinking. And I'd love some more reflections on this because it is kind of what is the next step for us to come together and very practically and tangibly you know, start building this superstructure we know we're all a part of. Um, pausing for reflections, thoughts that might. Yeah. Felipe, you got your hand? Yeah, yeah, well, first of all, <laughs> I would love to see what you just shared happening virtually, maybe starting next year. And also what uh, Roberto is calling to really plug these pieces together and co-create uh, the whole thing together and then ambitions uh, separately. And I'm very glad to hear all the wisdom. From so we right there real quick and then I'll send it right back to you. Um, yes, I think all of our projects, whoever wants to host it for that same period, let's do it. Um, and then in the third month, we actually start talking to other projects so we can weave it. So it doesn't have to all be in one location. So if other places, Liminal Village, TDF, et cetera, if any other projects in our alliance want to host this as well, uh, right? And then we can still host it through that three month period. But what we're also co-creating here is the rite of passage from one civilization to the next. This is so important to really you know, welcome ourselves, allow ourselves to step into that new reality, know that it's true. I mean, this is the rite of passage technology. It's been around for thousands, since time, since time began for humans, right? So this is one of the deepest technologies that our culture kind of just doesn't ignore, doesn't recognize, I guess, enough. Um, so that's what I really think we're co-creating here in all of our projects can next summer. And then the rite of passage is who are we? How do we fit into this? How do we really serve the bigger mission without burning out, without thinking we have to play it all right? 
And we do that when we go through this process. What does that actually look like? We don't know, we're co-creating. So that's the idea for especially this first one is we're holding the container, we're calling in the intention, but then we're designing it ourselves whilst we're in it, right? So it's it could be a lot of fun. Um, so passing back to you, Philippe, I wanted to plug that in because absolutely I think we can do this across the world and we don't say this is just going to happen, you know, in Asheville where we're at. Um, it's happening, yeah. right? Well, actually, I, I was proposing starting that conversation virtually, but yeah, I'm very glad because, for example, today that I get to hear uh, Jeff and Samuel, and, and it really inspires the conversation to move forward in a cohesive way, in a more in, in integrational. And what I feel is when, as the some of the wisdom tell us, like we also need to be very clear on what what's the simple way to to explain this even to children because that's when we really know we are carrying it playing very naturally what we want to accomplish maybe with very complex models or technologies and at the end what i what i noticing when i hear all of you is we really know we want the common good to be prevailing and serving the the whole ecosystem how do we start being uh, like very clear on what the basic, the principles, basic principles? So, for example, when we are talking about all these uh, profit and speculation and all that, like maybe coming from the from of what what for example is the value, and if we want to transmit to the investors that they the value its money, maybe transmitting the right message because for me. Entering an ecosystem like that, even if you have a lot, lots of money, the real value, if you're going to be able to share with people you and that the things that are happening in these spaces has much more value than just getting back money. So if we be, are able to transmit that message clearly, maybe we won't sell the money back, but just the, the real value that we hope. Thank you. Ooh, uh, Felipe, I, I absolutely love the grounded wisdom that you're holding and bringing every time. Thank you. Um, Tina and Neil, I wanted to hear from each of you, if we could just go for a few more minutes, because I want to bring in those voices before we close today. If anyone else has anything to share, feel free. Um, but Tina, can I call on you? No, <laughs> maybe you're not here right now. Um, and I'm also realizing I'm on another call. Um, so both of them just showed up. So Nikolai Basil, hello. Um, we will be closing here shortly. Does anyone else have any more wisdom they want to bring to the call before we close today? Session gathering. All right, we had covered a whole lot. I got pretty wild. <laughs> so I think next session, we're actually gonna come together. I put a mirror board together um, and we can start tangibly mapping out what we talked about because the output we were trying to achieve is you know, what platforms are we launching on? Where do we actually launch our DAOs? Where do the tokens go? And kind of some of those first questions with actually getting our you know, tokens and projects created. So we'll ground this a little bit more next week. And we'll keep letting this beautiful journey unfold. So as always, it's been awesome watching what happened today. Um, I came with a totally different expectation for this call. So I'm really happy what actually unfolded as always. So thank you all for participating and co-creating this wonderful session. Um, if you would like to just unmute yourself and say something as you go, feel free. And I will see you all in the metaverse in next week. Great work. Buddy. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, Thank you. See you next week. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Bye. See you all. So exciting.